Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 5N, the last of the Module 5 lectures and the last of our lectures about cancer and cancer risk. In this lecture we're going to talk briefly about two other cancers with more complex causations, colon cancer and prostate cancer. So colon cancer, or more correctly colorectal cancer, is mostly not familial. It's mostly sporadic. Only about 30% of cases are familial cases. And of those, about 5% are caused by specific high-risk genes like the BRCA system, where it's a mutation in a particular DNA repair pathway that predisposes cell, colon cells to develop into tumors. Then there's another 25% of all colon cancers that are still familial, but their genetic causes are not well understood. And then there's the 70% of colon cancers that are sporadic. They're not due to known risk factors. They don't run in families at all. Um, but we are finding some genome-wide association study results suggesting that there are SNPs associated with increased risk of sporadic colon cancer. So this complex graph does a good job of pulling apart the different components of the risk of colon, ca colon cancer. On the x-axis, we have the approximately frequency of cancer. These are the common colon cancers. They're the non-inherited ones, the sporadic colon cancers. Over here are the rare cancers that have a very high lifetime risk. So on this axis, we have the lifetime risk of colon cancer. At the bottom are genetic factors that, or other factors where you have a very low risk. And then up here are factors that cause a very high risk. What we see is that the factors that cause a high risk are relatively rare. So here I've circled them. They're mostly marked in red to indicate that the alleles that cause this risk are known. Again, these are loss of function mutations, um, and they fall under the two-hit model of cancer causation. If you have a loss of function mutation in one of these genes, you have a very high risk of developing colon cancer. Um, up here, if you have a mutation in FAP, you have almost 100% chance of getting colon cancer. Um, but less than 1% of total cases of colon cancer are people who have these mutations. The same for mutations in MAP and in AFAP. The risk factor, the risk is slightly less, still much more than 50%, and the incidence is small, less than 1%. Mutations in the LS have a 75% risk of colon cancer, they're present in 2 to 4%. They account for 2 to 4% of all colon cancers. So these are genes that have a well-defined genetic basis. It's known what the mutations are that cause these very high risks of colon cancer. The second group is genes, is colon cancers where it's known to be familial, but the actual genes responsible are not known. So here is a group of what's called high-risk familial cancers. The risk isn't as high as for these known genes, but it's still quite high, greater than 25% chance of getting colon cancer. But still, this accounts for only 1% to 2% of the cases, and the actual genes involved are just now becoming identified. Here's a more common um, group of people who have a familial basis, not as high a risk as these people, but still quite high. And the genome-wide association studies are being used to identify the alleles, or at least the SNPs, correlated with, associated with these high familial risks. Then over here, we have the large group of cancers for which there's no evidence of a familial basis. And genome-wide studies are also being used here. 
Oops. Oh, that back. Genome-wide association studies are also being used here to find the genes involved. Even though their effects are small enough that they're not seen as running in families, still they are genetic effects that contribute to your risk of getting colon cancer. Now, here are more circles plots, this time of colorectal tumors. And what's striking about these three tumors is that all three of them have the same red diagonal line. And this red diagonal line reflects a chromosomal rearrangement, a recombination between a position in chromosome 2 and a position at the end of chromosome 11, present in all three of these tumors. And that's a flag that this particular rearrangement probably is playing a causal role, at least in these tumors' um, abnormal growth properties. More generally, the interactions that are implicated by recurrent mutations, both recurrent rearrangements like the one you just saw, and many other genes that are mutated commonly in colon cancers um, give clues to the kinds of biochemical regulatory interactions that are going on in our cells that are disrupted in cancer cells. And these then provide clues for kinds of therapy um, that may be undertaken. Now let's turn our attention to prostate cancer. This is the most common cancer of men, at least in Western countries. Um, the graph here shows the rates of prostate cancer in different populations around the world. And what's really striking is the low risk of prostate cancer. The blue lines are cases, the green lines are death rates, and they're per 100,000 men. Um, it's quite low in Asian populations, quite high in European populations. Now, we don't know for sure how much of this variation is genetic, but it's likely that quite a bit of it is. Although age is the biggest risk factor for prostate cancer, it's very rare in young men, but quite common in the elderly, the heritability of prostate cancer has been estimated to be between 30 and 50 percent. Remember that measures of heritability depend on the environment and on the genetic distribution in the population. So, so far, genome-wide association studies have identified 77 loci that are associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer. And these loci explain 30% of the heritable risk. Now, this is another example of the missing heritability problem that we talked about earlier. We Genome-wide association studies are very powerful. They can identify loci that each make only a very, very small contribution to risk. We don't understand why they're not finding genes that make big contributions to risk. Now, I put up, I'm going to talk about briefly about the results from this particular study. I put up the title and the author list just because I wanted to, you to realize how much work goes into these um, genome-wide association studies. This was a meta-analysis, so these authors combined information from a number of studies, and these are the authors of all of the studies. There are 136 researchers contributed to this work, people from all over the world, so probably your taxpayer dollars are helping to address these questions. Now, these studies find the SNP loci that um, are associated with prostate cancer. How is this research being used to help people with cancer? Well, the first use is that SNP loci can be used to predict the risk of individuals. So this is using personal genomics of people who don't have prostate cancer to see how many of those high-risk um, SNP alleles do they have, and using that to predict 
their risk of getting prostate cancer. This is important because prostate cancer is sufficiently common that it's been decided that most screening is not very valuable. So the goal is to avoid screening in low-risk individuals. And that's because in these men, as it, the same story applies to breast cancer screening, in men who are at low risk of, of prostate cancer, the genetic screening is finding mostly um, either false alarms or very, very slowly growing cancers that would never kill a man. And so these men are being subject to really quite harmful treatments that they don't really need. So the goal is to only screen high-risk men and to screen them very thoroughly so as to catch their cancers very early when they can easily be treated. The second use is that SNP loci that are associated with cancers with different properties can be used to guide therapy. Some of these studies are distinguishing between what are called aggressive prostate cancers, ones that are growing fast and are hard, who's, are hard to treat, and what are often called indolent, that's another word meaning lazy, tumors. Tumors, these are the tumors that are growing slowly and probably will never kill the person who has them. So the goal is to identify, once a tumor is found, is it an indolent tumor? Maybe it doesn't need treatment at all, or maybe it needs only very mild treatment. Or is it an aggressive tumor, in which case you want to throw everything you have at it? Um, the third use is once you've found SNP loci that are associated with cancer risk or with particular tumors, then those genes can be, the genes that are identified by those, by those SNPs become candidate genes that are hypothesized to cause the differences in tumor progression. And these candidate genes can guide research into developing new therapies. So we've talked about the genetics of colorectal cancer and the genetics of prostate cancer. Probably the most important message to take away from this is that the things that I described for these cancers in particular apply to most cancers. These are Because these are common cancers, these are the ones that have gotten the most study, but most cancers will have the same properties. There will be many risk factors, each making a small contribution. There will be great diversity in the mutations that happen in the cancers. It's very difficult to winkle out the different components of causation. But there are ways that this information can be used, as I described in the last slide. Coming up next, that's the last lecture of Module 5. Coming up next is Module 6, where we're going to talk about personal genomics. I hope to see you there.